שם השם נעשה ונצליח, שיעור תורה, ברוכים הבאים, שבוע טוב, חודש טוב. Uh, to everyone, we're continuing our series with a new week, a new chodesh, a series of the um, Jewish Ashkafa, the Jewish ideology, uh, based on the uh, Sefer by the Chazonish, Alav Shalom. Tonight's shiur is for a uh, refuah shlema uh, for um, my dear daughter Sarah, but uh, Levana, uh, Rabbanit Levana, but uh, Sarah, uh, Rabbi Ephraim ben Shulamit, Rabbanit uh, uh, Sara, but Anat, Doris, but Jora, um, Michal, but Yael, Abigail, but Surya, Abigail, uh, um, but uh, Michal, uh, Levin, Ben uh, David, a Cohen, Chana, uh, Rivka, but uh, Vivian, Fortune, or Fortune, Orit, uh, but Ilana. David Ben Esriya, Doris Bajora, Yitro Ben Avraham, Talia Batzara, Stefan Ben Katarina, and um, also for a Atzlacha uh, Raba for Shaul Ben Farzane. Marsha, but uh, Julie, her dear daughter Ayla, but uh, Marsha, and um, also her sons uh, Samuel ben Marsha and Alexander ben Marsha, and also for a Zivugagun, Atzlacha Raba, uh, for uh, our uh, dear friend uh, Reuven Chaim ben Faila Farel. Kadosh Bochu Yivarechotam, Bekol Mikol Kol, Chaim Arukim, Shlemim, Elin Torah, Mitzvot, Gminut Chasadim, Nachat Bracha. And to all of Am Yisrael, especially the ones that help us with uh, helping Am Yisrael, helping the world see the light of the Torah, Baruch Hashem. Uh, there's uh, so much light in this darkness that uh, you always wonder why people waste their time. But of course, we see, we see that uh, this is really the Maase Satan, that um, you see that when uh, Moshe Rabbeinu in last week's parasha came back to Am Yisrael, came back to Am Yisrael and uh, told him that he's going to be the one that's going to uh, help them. This is the second time he came. And uh, he came to them and they said that uh, they didn't want to listen to him because they were too busy. Too busy with these new conditions that Paro gave them. Uh, they were so busy working. They were so busy watching the news. They were so busy dealing with the mundane of the world. They couldn't even pay attention even when the salvation came to them. Uh, and in essence, this is really what the Satan does to, uh, to everybody, where he busies us with all types of things, all types of news, uh, all types of uh, things that uh, are simply not important, but they look important. And uh, make no mistake about it, all media is the same. There is no such thing as kosher media. There is no such thing as kosher news. Their job is to scare you. And I can tell you just even from, from my own... Uh, little experiment uh, that I did, uh, I think, about a week ago or so, a week, week and a half ago. Uh, there was an um, Israeli guy that uh, reports the news, if you will, and uh, he's an independent new, uh, reporter, and he's on all types of uh, news outlets and so on, and he uh, seems like a nice guy, very loving and so on, and a uh, very friendly person. And, uh, but, uh, you know, he says he has this, you know, the scoop. So his main thing has been, you know, obviously like everybody else, you know, there is no news if you're not going to talk about Corona or you're not going to talk about the elections, you're not going to talk about all the drama that's everywhere. And, uh, somebody brought this to my attention and say, oh, listen, this guy has something to say about what's going on. That's not being said elsewhere. Not that I know what's being said elsewhere, but nonetheless, I looked at it and I saw that he had the, uh, I don't know, maybe three, four minute uh, uh, news clip where he said that there is major things coming from the White House. It's, it's a breakthrough. It's break this and it's break that. And he doesn't really tell you what's actually happening. But, you know, until the end, he says, oh, yeah, the, uh, um, what's his name? Uh, Biden's uh, uh, son is a pedophile and his other people and their pedophiles and his whole ring. I mean, it's really old news, by the way, but there's more coming and there's more of this and don't worry. So, okay, so 
I uh, stayed uh, in touch, I guess, if you will, to, to see what's going on. What's the new scoop? What's the new scoop over the next three days? And it's heavy uh, levelim. It's complete garbage, like everything else in the world. Even though he's a seeker of truth, as he claims, and he's a reporter of truth, as he claims, and and so on and so forth. It's all, all the good stuff. It's all garbage. Why is it all garbage? Because the main job of media is, in essence, to be shlichim of the Satan, to be the, the the messengers of the Satan himself, which is to busy you, busy you with things aside from the Torah. Busy with things that are aside from your actual real mission in the world. Things that you could actually do something about. No, busy with stuff that you can't do anything about. So all day, all they do in their groups or whatever it is, that they constantly send you pictures of airplanes. Oh, look, there's airplanes flying over Washington. I think something's happening. And then they give you another drawing or another map of another plane. And he put like little lines. Oh, this plane went over here and then it came back. Something must be going down. I think Trump's about to take down the White House. I think this. And all this nonsense conspiracy and just literally complete garbage that has thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people following. And Baruch Hashem, only me for a couple of days for the sake of the experiment itself. And literally seeing that... Not only is it garbage, but now you understand how smart the Satan is. Because he gives you things that are interesting. He doesn't give you stuff that's boring. He gives you things that are interesting. He gives you things that scare you to death if you don't have Torah in your life. And even if you do, if you, you, you delve into it for too long, you're, you're bound to get scared. And you start believing this garbage. Oh, look, there's a drawing, there's a plane that you could pretty much get from the internet. Just type in plane, 747, army, and you'll get five zillion pictures. Oh, and get a map and copy and paste the two. And then just put some drawings on it. And he says something's happening because the plane flew from point A to point B and then back to point A again. Something must be happening. Well, yeah, planes fly. And they fly from place to place. What do you want them to do? Park? But that's the thing. People are looking for news. They're looking for something happening. You know, there has to be a civil war happening in the White House. Why? Because Trump and his followers don't agree with Biden and his followers, and it's a stolen election, and it's, a, it's all garbage, Rabotai. It's all garbage. Stolen election, not stolen election. It's all literally garbage. Evel Avalim. It's just complete nonsense. Satan is st- simply stealing your mind. Stealing your mind for as much time as he can, day by day, day after day. Why? So long as he has your mind, you cannot fulfill your purpose in the world. And that's what he does. That's what he does with everybody. And unfortunately, Rabotai Karim, this has happened in the last year, I think, to a larger extent than any other time that I know of, uh, simply because you see that stealing the minds of the secular people the non-jews and so on it that's something that's happened throughout all of history but what i see has happened over the last year is that the satan has stolen the mind of many religious people many people that are even learners people that tell me deen they learn torah but he has stolen their mind also where constantly people are talking about coronavirus the vaccine the people behind it the pharmaceutical companies i hate them I love them, it's going to cure you, it's going to kill you, it's going to this you, it's going to that you, it's not going to help, it already helped, it's secretly helping, it's really killing, it's going to depopulize. No, it's going to give you extra extra babies. Six, you know, it, all, every day is something new, something new, something new. And what's happening? What happens in the end? That's all people talk about now in Shiurim. Literally, that's, you see, one shiur after another. Oh, in the coronavirus section. Like, every shiur has a segment of coronavirus. And, and in essence, this is one itself. Not that, you know, obviously, we're promoting, but you get my point. Every shiur the Satan gets a little piece of. A little piece of bitul Torah. A little piece of, let's waste everybody's time. And Abu Tayyip Karim is wasting your time. Please, please, do yourself a favor, or at the very least, do me a favor. Stop sending me stuff. Stop sending me all these uh, snapshots that you get. Oh, here's the list of Rabbanim that have signed against the coronavirus. And then 30 seconds later, here's the list of Rabbanim that love the coronavirus and the vaccine. Rabotai, first and foremost, most of the lists are fakes. They're fake. 
How do I know? Simple. Most people are not going to check them. And the fakers rely on that. And there's a lot of people that haven't even put their name on anything. There's been already several times that people have reported fake lists. They even reported a, a letter by uh, one of the Gdolim of America, Rav uh, Kaminetsky, that he is for the vaccine or he's against the vaccine. And he wrote a letter. I didn't, I didn't say anything. All of these letters that you're circulating is just Masse Satan. Masse Satan. You circulate those letters, you talk about this stuff all day, you say, oh yeah, this election, the coronavirus, all this stuff, simply you have decided to become one of the Shlichim of a Satan. Why? None of it's going to help you. None of it's going to help Am Yisrael. None of it. The only thing that's going to help Am Yisrael is to do what HaKadosh Baruch Hu said. And you're going to say, wait, but aren't you so, all of a sudden you're, you're, uh, you're a Talmud Chacham, you're going to give me a, a verse from the Torah that you have to protect your Neshama. Yeah, protect your Neshama by learning Torah. Protect your Neshama by doing Chesed. Protect your Neshama by doing something that's actually in the Torah as actual commandment, aside from watching the news and being up to date with all the garbage that's out there. Because in reality, what can you possibly do about it anyway? Whether Trump won or he lost, whether Biden won or he lost, whether coronavirus vaccine is, is, is a, a cure or it's a poison. What, what are you really going to do about it? So again, Rabotai, it's, it's, a, it's very important. It's very important that people know this stuff because this is indeed part of the Jewish ideology. If you have spent a large part of your days chasing the news and following the death tolls, the, the, the vaccine news, the, and, and you tend to uh, find yourself listening more and more to rabbis that talk about this whole situation, whether they're for it or not is irrelevant because both sides are right and wrong at the same time. Uh, if you see yourself that this has become your new thing, just know you're part of a new religion. Why? It's called Corona. It's called Corona. It's called media. It's called Satan. That's what it is. Akadosh Baruch Hu does not want you to be an expert in Corona vaccines. Akadosh Baruch Hu does not want you to be an expert in politics. Akadosh Baruch Hu does not want you to be an expert in messianic times. Like some people like to, oh yeah, this year, uh, Rabbi so-and-so said that he's going to come before Rosh Hashanah. Oh yeah, okay, so Rabbi so-and-so became God, when? When did he become God? Rabotai Yekarim, this is Oma Satan. All of it, every single part of it, whether they're talking for it, against it, it's all bitul Torah, it's all a complete waste of time. All of it. Now, as far as taking the vaccine or not, it's simple. It's, it's, not really, it's, it's, it's not really something that I think anybody should overthink. If you live in a country where it's an obligation to take the vaccine or go to jail or get fined a, a number that you can't afford and so on and so forth, either move from the country or take the vaccine. Simple. If you live in a country that gives you the ability to choose, take the vaccine, don't take the vaccine. Take the vaccine and you'll live according to them. Don't take the vaccine and you'll die according to them, which is the opposite by the, uh, by the, by the, uh, you know, by the, uh, by the naysayers or the people that say the opposite. But they give you so many words, they tell you you can take it or not. If you don't want to take it, don't take it. Simple. Don't take it. If you want to take it, my bro, go take it. Take two, take my dose also. What's the, what's the whole thing? Well, why is everybody always fanatic about this? Fanatic, fanatic. The people that are for it, they say, oh, the people that are not taking it. They're killing people. They're murderers. Why murderers? If you took the vaccine, why are you worried if I didn't take the vaccine? If you took the vaccine, you're protected. So what are you worried about whether I took it or not? You're protected. What do you care about? No, but they're hurting society. So the ones that take it, they figure like the whole world needs to take it. But they're not as bad as the ones that refuse to take it because of all the different conspiracies. You know, it's Bill Gates. He's trying to depopulate the world, go from 8 billion to 1 billion so you could have some type of benefit out of people dying. I have no idea what the benefit is, but nonetheless, somehow there's a benefit in people dying. Uh, apparently, maybe invested in morgues and, and, and cemeteries. I'm not really sure. But anyway, 
It's a, uh, the people that are saying that, you know, this killer is behind it. The government's going to kill you. Bill Gates is going to kill you. George Soros is going to kill you. All these wicked people, they all want to kill you. And God has nothing to say about it. Like as if God's out of the picture. George Soros, Bill Gates, and the rest of the people behind it, they became the new God. Do you realize what you're saying is kfirah gemurah? It's complete heresy. To think for a second that anybody, anybody, anybody whether it be bill gates his friends uh, donald trump his friends biden his friends the whole world combined and even moshe rabbeinu i love a shalom do you think that any of them can say anything that is going to supersede a kadosh Bahu's control what world do you live in but unfortunately the naysayers forgot about hashem and they're simply telling the world no you take this you're gonna die you take this vaccine you're gonna die you're gonna okay well first and foremost i don't know i heard there's a couple of deaths there's actually one local one here in florida some doctor took it and he died a few days later now whether it's from the vaccine or not let's say it is okay let's look at statistics how many people took the vaccine already i'm assuming at this point it's quite a bit a few million already okay so you have a few deaths it's not exactly the end of the world now don't take for a second that this is a promotion of the vaccine i'm not taking it but to go and say that it's gonna kill you if you take it is a very far stretch from reality even if it's not good for you to say it's gonna kill you it's a far stretch from reality it's a real far stretch from reality meaning that your decisions are not being made by your brain they're not being made by your datora they're being made by your emotions and that is a violation of the jewish ideology the whole point of what the chazonish has been trying to teach us in regards to the jewish ideology is to take your emotions and put your brain put your brain in control of your emotions stop going crazy about vaccines and elections and everything else in all the milvado there's nothing else but him there's nothing else but akadosh Baruch Hu. nothing 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 else in the world exists other than akadosh Baruch Hu. and that's a reality the more we realize that the less anxiety we have but unfortunately what ends up happening we put ourselves in harm's way we watch the news we watch it on tv we watch it in the uh you know people think no no no, i don't have tv in my house so how do you know the whole all the news why well, I, I see it on the internet it's the same thing or even worse internet media or or uh or uh tv media it's the same exact thing or worse or somebody said no no i don't have i don't have the internet i don't have anything oh, so how do you hear the news how do you know all this stuff oh well, a radio are you are you are you dumb it's the same thing you're getting the information you're spending the vast majority of your day listening to news that is going to kill you spiritually why because Rabotai, first and foremost their number one job of the media is to scare you to death and give you bad news why that's what keeps you coming if all day they were reporting that people winning the lotto all day they were reporting that people were signing billion dollar deals and you're the only one little homeless you barely could make rent you're not winning any lotto you're not getting any million dollar contracts guess what you'd stop going back to that show why it's boring it's boring you're hearing everybody else is winning and you're the only one that's losing barely making your fifty thousand dollars a year hundred thousand a year you start feeling poor making a million dollars a year if, if everybody was winning the lotto every day so why do you keep why do they what, what do they do to you they say no no we need universal news we need news that everyone can relate to you the rich guy the poor guy the homeless guy the guy that just made it the the, the rapper the gangster the uh the, the the guy that's a wall streeter the guy that's a doctor the lawyer everyone can relate the mother the father the mother that thinks she's a father and the father that thinks she's a mother everybody can relate who oh, what misery misery loves company that's all the news reports misery miserable things sad things things that are literally just horrible incredibly horrible and guess what when there isn't enough they make stuff up simple who's going to do anything about it once in a while somebody say hey listen you said that that happened it didn't really happen you know a lot of people got sad and worried oh oops okay another news uh da -da -da. wait a bunch of people just got cried for an hour and a half because of that news you said okay big deal what can we do 
So let's just report about the fact that we misreported, and that's kind of sad too. So let's, you know, segue into another sad report. And that's all news does. Satan, Malach HaMavet, Yetzirah, he controls the media. It's not George Soros or any of his buddies. It's Mamash Malach HaMavet. George Soros is like a Darth Vader character. The guy's never going to die. So Hashem, today's Ayn Arai, he's going to die soon. But problem is, his son is even worse than him. So don't, don't get your hopes up. The reality is, Rabotai, is that you have a world where the Satan simply has put his throne, put his throne in plain sight. But no one's paying attention. In plain sight, he tells you, listen, I'm going to constantly consume your mind with bad news, with the media, about anything I can get. And he has succeeded. If he had a stock in the last year, his stock was better than Bitcoin, was better than any than Amazon, was better than anything in the world. Why? Literally, he has consumed the minds of society and even the religious folks. Even the religious community has literally been consumed by the media to such an extent that that's all people talk about. That's all people talk about all day, all night. And again, it's both sides, pro, against, any issue. And there's really two main issues right now, which is the the, the election situation in America. Maybe some people waste their time with the elections in Israel. And then obviously coronavirus. This Rabotai is Maase Satan. And that's why it's important for you to at the very least at the very least do yourself a service do yourself a service and that if you're going to consume that much media at the very least study just as much torah to counteract at the very maybe you'll end up at like net zero at the end of the day or net one plus one you're not going to be net that much because that much filth in your mind again true not true is irrelevant that much garbage in your mind from the media is definitely going to hurt your Torah, for sure. I can tell you, just with my little experiment, I may have seen or spent, I don't know, total of maybe 15 to 20 minutes over the three days on this stuff. Already I started seeing there's some nerves that I, don't, I haven't felt in a long time. Why am I worried? The guy just showed me a bunch of drawings of planes going from point A to point B, and then he took some photos of some army guys, you know, hanging around Washington, D.C. Like, why is that abnormal? Oh, the National Guard is coming to, to Washington, D.C. Sure. What else do you want them to do? Go bowling? What else does the National Guard do? They go to Washington, D.C. There's a suppose, you know, there's, there's stuff happening. Like, so what? Why do I need to know this? Why do I need to worry about this? Oh, the best part, the best part, Rabotai, is what I got Motse Shabbat. Like, someone felt this is so important, they have to send it to me. Right on Motzei Shabbat. I don't check my phone right after Motzei Shabbat. But nonetheless, I saw that this was on the dot Motzei Shabbat. What? Some yo-yo speaks Hebrew. I don't know. I think he's a Rav. I'm not really sure who he is, though. But anyway, he starts the message. Listen, ladies and gentlemen, if I lie, if I say anything wrong, you could just stop listening to me. You could just... You know, put a, you know, put me on cherem, put me this. Like, you know, he's like self-effacing, miserable type of like introduction. Like, don't poor me, but really I'm trying to help you type of message. Two minutes of this garbage. Then 30 seconds after that, he gives the message. I already stopped at that point. There was six minutes more to go. There's just a complete waste of time. What is it? He says, I have news from somebody that's reliable. Already red flag number one. Why can't you say the name? If they're reliable, why can't you say the name? I have news from reliable. That, listen, within the next two days, Iran is going to be wiped off the map. This is what he says. This, this idiot. And I'll call him an idiot because only idiots say stupid things like this. Iran is going to be, you know, removed from the map. And there's going to be a, uh, a, a blackout in the world. So gather your waters, gather your, 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 your food, and uh, it's not going to be any internet, only for governments and really important people are going to have the internet. So no more Facebook Live, apparently. Uh, <laughs> and no more internet, blackout to the whole world. Iran is going to be wiped out, and this is within the next two days. Now you could say, well, how do you know that's not true? I don't know. I've been around the world for long enough and to know that stupid things like this, if it was true, surely it would not be on WhatsApp. And if it's not true, it's going to be on WhatsApp. 
more than that, the world doesn't function that way. You don't just decide to wipe out a country, even if they're evil. Even if you know they're evil and they're planning on doing more and more evil things, they have friends. They're not evil by themselves. And even if they didn't have friends, you don't just get the permission to just wipe out a whole civilization. It doesn't work that way. And furthermore, what does that have to do with a blackout completely worldwide? The point being, Rabutai, is that these people, when they're saying this stuff, I bet he thinks what he said is true. That's why he gave that two-minute introduction. But that's also, from the Torah, we learn not to listen to people like this. Why? Reuven. Reuven is Kodesh Kodeshim. Reuven was Kodesh Kodeshim, was the first Baal Tshuva. First Baal Tshuva of the tribes. He made a mistake. He moved his mother's bed. And Yaakov rebuked him. Nonetheless, Reuven was a Baal Tshuva. But after, after uh, Yosef was gone for almost 20 years, and now the, uh, the tribes went to Egypt to go get some food. They didn't realize that Yosef was actually the viceroy of Egypt. And, uh, you know, the whole story goes of how Yosef said, listen, you tell me that you have a father and you have another uh, brother. I want to see this brother before I, you know, before I decide to give you guys food because I want to know that you're not really a uh, spy for a different country. You're really telling me the truth that you really do have another brother. And I'm not going to give you anything unless you give me that other brother. Plus, I'm going to take one of the brothers in jail. Shimon. Long story short, they come back, they go back, the tribes go to, to their father, to Yaakov. They tell Yaakov, listen, this, uh, this king, this viceroy, uh, he's a really uh, you know, scary guy. He says he's not going to give us anything unless we bring Benjamin, Benjamin in English, back and show him that he's really a person. And Yaakov says, oh no, you know, already his, his brother died. Now Shimon is in jail already over there now you're going to take benjamin no listen if he kills benjamin now benjamin dies on the way which by the way as a side note the, the uh the midrash says that yaakov was especially scared that they're going to kill benjamin because benjamin would turn into a werewolf i know that throws you a curveball but just for the hell of it it really is true you benjamin turned into a werewolf and he thought that once the egyptians see a human turn into a werewolf they'll probably kill him needless to say yaakov was worried he didn't want to send Benjamin. No, he already lost his brother. It's his, uh, you know, from his favorite wife, Rachel. There's only, uh, there's only Benjamin left. He didn't want to do it. So comes Reuven. Comes Reuven. Reuven was the, the firstborn, Tzadik, Kodesh Kodeshim. But in this little instant, he made a mistake. What did he do? He comes to his father. He says, Abba, let me take charge of this mission. I'm going to take Benjamin. And I'm going to bring him back to you. And if I don't bring him back to you, you can kill both of my sons. That's what he says to him. I'm going to take your son. I'm going to bring him back. But if I don't bring him back, you could just kill my two sons. And then you see the, that Yaakov doesn't even respond to him. He completely just moves on and they don't do anything for a while until Yuda gives him a different proposal and then uh, they move on. Why? Why doesn't Yaakov respond to him? Why? Chachamim say, Yaakov looked at Reuven and like, are you drunk? Are you drunk? Like, is something wrong with you? Why would I want to take such a deal where you're telling me that you're going to take my last son from his mother and if you don't bring him back, I'm just going to kill two more grandsons? So not only did I lose one son, I'm going to actually lose two more? What kind of stupid deal is this? This is an emotional deal. You're not thinking right, Leuven. This guy that made that message and many of the people that are making these messages, some are long, some are short, some are six minutes, some are two hour lectures on video and so on. All of these messages are literally calls for help. They're like 911, but you're acting as 911. Only you think that they are 911. It's completely crazy. Please stop wasting your time. Listen to Torah. If somebody speaks Torah, listen to them. They don't speak Torah, move on to the next thing. Why? Because Torah is the only thing that's going to help you. Even if all hell is really breaking loose, whether it's Corona or the vaccine or the election or the blackout, or all of the things that we said and didn't say and all that other stuff, the only thing that's going to help you anyway is the Torah Kedusha. That's the only thing that's going to help you. And at this specific moment, at this specific time, one of the main things that we need to do, Rabotai Karim, is Tikkun Shovavim. Tikkun Shovavim 
is to fix our past mistakes when it comes to immorality when it comes to wasting seed promiscuity uh, Jew with a non-Jew and so on and so forth it's a main time for it during the time of Sefer Shemot this is what we're supposed to do as Jews every year year after year why because a person that arrives at the bed dean of heaven with this sin on his or her belt has a very serious problem a very very serious a very expensive problem but you can't pay for it over there with money so I I hope that each and every one of you are taking advantage of the shulim that we have online on for free you can watch them learn it do the tikkunim either by sharing the lectures sponsoring it do whatever you can to fix that why because without tikkun abrit rabotai Mashiach is not going to come in a very good way whatever the news is going to tell you that's not going to help you doing tikkun abrit that's going to help you and that's one of the things that I believe is a critical critical lesson that we learn from from uh from this uh parasha of last week from this parasha of, of just this past week or this week why because sometimes you see that there are people that say good things but what they're saying is not good they they're good people but they're not acting good one small example you'll see that Paro in last week's Parashat Vayera says at the end of the parasha he says Chatati Adonai Tzadik v'ani v'ami Arashaim. Paro says to Moshe this time I have sinned Hashem is the Tzadik Hashem is the righteous one and I and my people are Arashaim are wicked ones sounds like Paro did Shuvah Oh, finally admitting that he's wicked and Hashem is righteous. I mean, at the beginning of this whole relationship, he said, who is this Hashem that I need to even listen to him? All of a sudden, not only does he recognize who Hashem is, but he even says that Hashem is righteous. Hashem is the right one. And on top of it, he admits that he did wrong. I mean, that's that's miles apart. Wow. Paro, why don't you give us a shiur? Maybe tell us how you did Shiva so quickly. Says big words, big promises. But that's all it was that's all it was why a few verses later a few verses later it says paro continued to sin simple all continued to sin why because of botaya kareem words as my father always told me words are free that's why people talk a lot words are free in essence, that's one of the things that Chazonish is trying to teach us in this week's section. We are in the third chapter called Musar and Alakha. And uh, we are in the uh, second section in the third chapter. And he says the following. One of the obligations of morality is that a person should try to instill in his heart this great principle he's introducing now a principle that is important enough for him to write a whole section about it's not a very long principle it's not something that's difficult to understand even but nonetheless it's critical enough that the chazonish takes a section and says this is important this is critical important this is one of those things where you have it you have everything because you can build on it you don't have it whatever you have is going to fall apart it's rotten it's going to break apart it's simply just a waste of time to do everything without it that's how important it is what is this principle in any case in which a person finds himself in opposition to a fellow Jew one has to weigh the matter in accordance with Allah in order to define who the persecutor is and who is the persecuted this may seem like common sense but common sense is not so common here the Chazunish says whatever situation you find yourself in you are on the way to work somebody cuts you off you obviously feel 
like you have been persecuted you've been violated you start honking to make sure that even his ancestors that are already in the grave they hear you too and maybe you share a few words of kindness why right, you feel like he took advantage of you he violated you he did this he did that or she did this or she did that and so on and so forth right you arrive to work and your fellow co-workers just walk by you without even recognizing that you exist as if you're a ghost and they walk through you you feel violated you feel disrespected who are these people what's going on why is everybody treating me this way I'm in this company for five years 10 years 20 years I helped build the foundation of the company at the least I should get is some respect some uh some uh hello something some nothing okay you order some food in the afternoon you find some kosher place send you the food there you order the food they say it's going to be there in a half hour three hours later it finally arrives and it's cold you feel violated you see you feel disrespected you feel like no one cares about who you are and what you are and they don't realize that you're really hungry now you don't even want it you want your money back and so on and so forth then after that you figure okay the hell with this day i'm going home you go home and of course everybody has their traffic issues on the way home depending on where you live needless to say everyone can't wait to get home you finally get home you're expecting your kids to run out to you hey abba ima how are you how are you you get into the house hey i am home silence nothing oh maybe nobody's home but then as you walk through you see one kids with video games another one is playing basketball in the backyard another one is uh you know doing his homework and your wife is on the phone with her friend hey i'm home and all you get is like like well like yeah we know you're here we're here too you feel where they even come to this place they're not even looking forward to seeing me what's going on which by the way that's horrible i'm giving you like a horrible scenario but nonetheless this is common in, in most people's lives this is common also means that the house doesn't have much Torah because the house that has Torah doesn't act like this point being is you feel like eh, what's going on here I'm I'm, I'm I'm why why is she picking on me why is everything going wrong then you go look at your stock account you see your stock account market went up your stock account went down you lost 20 30 50 hundred thousand dollars for the day 10 percent of your value of your portfolio 20 percent of the value of your portfolio you have no idea what just happened you call your brokers hey, hey what's going on what'd you do nothing uh listen one of the companies we had a big investment in they reported earnings that were really really good but the market didn't like it anyway anyway nothing makes any sense your account down 10 20 percent you start looking up at Shemayim, like, what do you want what's going on why are you picking on me and this is a this is a reality this is a reality of you know all of a sudden all types of things happen in your life and you feel like you're being persecuted persecuted by the people persecuted by Hashem Chazoni says one of the most pr- uh, important principles one of the most important principles that a person should instill into their heart is the ability the ability to decipher who is the persecuted and who is the persecutor in accordance to Allah why in accordance to Allah why can't it just be the way I feel I grew up I I know a few things I uh grew up with certain type of Masoret a certain type of a uh, heritage culture customs life lessons street knowledge experience whatever other word I come up with for now that's about five it's all I come up with so far uh, the point is I came up with some stuff why why can't that just be enough like you know sometimes people tell you listen I don't know as much Torah as you rabbi but I know how I feel I know how I feel and I know what's right and that's what they tell you they honestly think that that's enough that's actually gonna cut it in Shemaim they feel like I don't know what it says in the Torah but I know what's right I know what's right and that's what's right because I know what's right and people actually believe this type of mumbo jumbo mentality and think this actually will cut any like like Hashem actually cares about that at all in any shape way or form when the Torah says the opposite you see Rabotai 
The Chazonis specifically said, number one, this is important. Number one, number two, it's really important. Number three, you need this. Number four, once you realize what this is, realize it's not just determining who's the persecuted, who's the persecutor, which are things that everybody thinks they can do pretty good. Know that it's only valuable if you can assess those things based on Allah, based on the laws of the Torah. Without it, what you have is useless. So are you telling me that my feelings are useless? More or less. Why? We don't necessarily care so much about human feelings when they contradict what Hashem said. Now, if your feelings are in accordance with Hashem, ah, Baruch Haba, we love your feelings, you are uh, truly showing signs that he's your father. You feel like him. But if your feelings contradict what Hashem said, sorry, your feelings don't matter. The Chazuni says that a person has to know how to decipher, know how to decipher in every one of the circumstances that he puts himself into or he's put into by divine presidents, providence but that uh he is in some type of altercation he's in a business deal he is in a watching the news he's watching black Lives matters he's watching some kid that was killed by the cops he's watching politicians take advantage of each other whenever they possibly can he's looking at a hostile takeover in the market he's looking at a uh you know a different transaction in business he's looking at one of the partners in his company taking advantage of the other one or stealing or this He's looking at cheating, lying. He's looking at all types of things. And he says, oh, that's the persecutor. And that's the persecuted. He can tell. He's like, no, no. See that guy? Yeah, that guy. He has a black guy. Yeah, that guy. He's been prosecuted. He's been persecuted against. He's the poor guy. He's, uh, I'm going to hug him and and, and say, if I, you know, anything you need, I'm going to help you out. What about that other guy that's standing up with a smile on? Oh, yeah, that guy's evil. That guy is, uh... He's an evil person. He's persecuting everyone. Why? Because of the way he looks? Yeah, no, listen. Surely that guy, you know, I mean, that guy, he's just a, uh, he's just an employee. And that guy, he's a boss. So, of course, if he's the boss and he's the employee, surely it's the boss that's taking advantage of the employee. Or better yet, she's a woman and he's a man surely the woman is inferior you know that's why he took advantage of her it's a, so surely she is the persecuted against and he is the pros- persecutor and you start assessing things based on the way it looks stereotypes if you will he's black he's white he's uh you know a uh, minor he's a this he's a, all types of things like this all types of stereotypes but Chazanish didn't say look at stereotypes he says look at Allah look at Allah and that's how you discern determine who is prosecuted against who is the persecutor meaning who's the good guy who's the bad guy in so many words the study of perfecting one's character traits meaning Musal instills in one love and pity for the persecuted and severe condemnation of the persecutor when a person learns our type of lectures which in essence are the vast majority of them is talking about Musar which is developing character traits naturally if you're going to continue watching this series and other lectures that we make naturally you're going to become a little bit more or you read books that are about Musar uh, things that we quote or otherwise what Chazuni says is that when you learn more Musar you're going to become more sensitive more sensitive to society than what you were beforehand specifically when it comes to when there are bullies out there taking advantage of people when there are people that are being persecuted against and perhaps when there are people that are going against everybody else bullying everybody else you're going to have a lot of love and pity for those that have been persecuted against hence the reason of why many people that are ballet chuva you know in the beginning they feel this new newfound love to the jewish people 
New found love, especially if they're history buffs. They look at what happened in the Holocaust, or the Spanish Inquisition, or the blood libels all throughout all of history, or all of you know, the destruction of the Bet Migdash. Look how much we've been persecuted against. Look at that, you know, it's, 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 it's terrible, it's horrible, you know, his father's a Holocaust survivor, his grandfather is, he's this, he's that, oh, this guy, yeah, he didn't get a job because he's a Jew, oh, she didn't get a she do, all types of things, uh, you know, so there's this new thing, like, you new found love you never felt before, and it's obviously also in it from people that are already from, where they feel like we have this unity because we've all been persecuted against, which is really not that true, because not everybody has felt persecution. Some, many, but not everybody. You can't just say every Jew has been persecuted against. Why? Because some people simply haven't for different reasons. Some people it's because they act more like goyim than, it's be- than Jews, so no one even knows they're even Jews. Some it's just simply because Hashem didn't give them that, uh, that tikkun yet, or at all. But the point being is to say that, uh, you know, that the nation as a whole today got persecuted against is not necessarily true. In the past, obviously, it was much more. The world was very, very different. It's just like, for example, the black people today in America say that they, they've been persecuted against slavery. First of all, you have no connection whatsoever to slavery. That's very much, much, you know, long time ago. And you're wearing, wearing $400 sneakers. Your ancestors didn't have shoes. So I'm not really sure how persecuted you are. As far as the whole job market and and, and social status, I don't know. To my knowledge, I dealt with many, many really successful African-American people, Mexican people, Chinese people, Japanese people, people of all colors. Anyone that wants to succeed finds a way. So I don't really think that whole uh, argument holds any weight, especially not in America. But point is, some people want to feel persecuted and some people even make a whole career of highlighting the persecution that they could somehow find somewhere because there's always going to be some idiot that persecutes somebody else and is racist and is uh is is doing something wrong just because of some type of stereotype or some type of just simple hatred for no reason it's always going to be that and there's some people that make a whole career of that now before you jump the gun and say listen because he's black and the other guy's white therefore it had to have been that the guy is black he got persecuted against the guy that's white he's the prosecutor before you jump the gun you say oh woman oh for sure she's a little woman she for sure is innocent she's for sure didn't do anything that guy look at him he's successful he's this he's that he probably did something to her he touched her he did this to her. he did that to her people have the stereotypes in their heads and the truth is is that couldn't be further from the truth especially in today's world one time Rabbi Ephraim walks into a taxi and he starts talking to the taxi driver and the taxi driver says to him he says you know many people have this uh go camera on their cars that's uh, showing the road so in case there's any accidents you can show to the insurance company and uh to your boss and anybody else whose fault really it is that if there is an accident he says, but my cameras, I have several cameras pointing into the car, not out of the car. And how if I'm system, why? He says, because I learned one time. One time is all I needed to learn this. One time, he says, this immodest girl walks into, uh, into my taxi and she starts telling me to go to different places. So I take her to different places, drop her off here she says i'll wait five minutes i'll come out i'll get this and this and this you know she keeps going to different locations at the end of this whole long several hour trip tells me to take her all the way to tel aviv over there where sodom and gomorrah is and then she's about to let, leave the car I say, hey excuse me uh ma'am you have to pay the bill she says to me with a clear conscience i'm gonna walk out of this car i'm not gonna pay a penny and if you say anything, I'm going to scream that you raped me. I knew at that moment, there's nothing I can do about it. There's nothing I can do about it. Why? This girl, everyone's going to believe her, especially in Tel Aviv over there. 
liberal central over there lefty liberal central over there for sure they're gonna believe her I'm, I'm a guy and they don't like me I'm already I'm a religious guy they think that for sure I'm some type of sociopath according to them and her she's one of them so for sure I'm the I'm the one that's uh you know guilty before even proven anything she's innocent victim so from that day on I let her go I didn't say nothing she left she stole the money but from that day on I said that's never gonna happen to me again as, at least to my control I'm gonna do some type of uh, protection how every time somebody walks in camera turns on and that's it they know they're being recorded I have a sign over there tell them you're being recorded so nobody tries to play that game again now if you saw that young girl coming out of that car screaming rape rape help me help me surely the average person will say oh no without even thinking take the girl save her grab the guy you know make sure he gets a little bit of a massage you know the kind that hurts for a few days maybe even on the face and you make sure that he doesn't do that again right because why that's the way it looks little do you know she's the evil monster she's the evil monster that just wasted his time stole his money and played him like a violin putting him in a situation where he literally cannot even defend himself can't do nothing about it nothing so here we see that the looks at the very least are very deceiving many times many times it's one time a young girl screaming yelling with the little boy next to her and you see that next to her is a another guy looks pretty respectable everything automatically you think oh poor girl this guy's taking advantage of her what's going on here you know people tune in it's New York you know everybody needs to know everybody's business there's only 20 million people in the in the city so you got to make sure you need to know everybody's business and before you know it somebody decides to be a superhero say hey and he jumps in the middle of the argument hey, hey guy you go your way I'm gonna I'm gonna help her I'm gonna help her he thinks a superhero he's gonna defend her he's gonna defend her with the little with the little kid why because it looks like she's like a little woman and she's got a little kid next to her and she's crying and yelling and the other guy is nonchalant about it so it looks like he's like an evil monster he's like you know has like ice in his veins instead of blood so Mr superhero from the construction company says hey I'll take care of you Lee don't worry you're you're you're, you're with me from now on and you're you're I'll take care of you and he starts pushing the guy around the guy says to him says, what are you doing do you even know what you're talking about do you know what you're talking about the guy starts pushing what are you doing what are you doing don't touch me don't do that oh. they break it up so the guy feels like a superhero oh you're with me you're with me he takes her out come on let's have uh, some lunch takes him to eat the girl's happy now the little kid's happy yeah happy 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 before you know it they act like a married couple and before you know it everything is good kumbaya they're, they're living in his house and you know what it doesn't even like cross his head to ask why did you even fight with this guy why'd you fight with this guy a little while past he feels like a superhero he's buying her whatever she wants he's doing whatever she wants he feels like a superhero he feels like he saved her from the monster only to find out after he finally asked the question hey by the way that guy ever bother you again and she says to him who my husband husband what do you mean husband you mean the, you mean the guy that yeah your husband I thought you weren't married no no he's my husband so what what are you doing with me what, what, what do you mean he's with what, what do you mean husband yeah no it's, it's he's he got mad at me so you know he doesn't want to talk to me what do you mean he's he knows you're here yeah yeah he knows me he doesn't care why doesn't he why doesn't your husband care that you're here with his son oh no no that's the problem that's why he doesn't care because he found out that this little kid is not his son it's his brother's son all of a sudden world collapsed you thought you were a hero you realize just now you just helped Iran build an atomic bomb you just simply realized that you just helped the enemy 
you help the bad guy, not the good guy. But looks can be deceiving. This happens all the time, Abutai. This is why the Chazuni says this is a very, very great principle. It's a very important principle. The only way that you're able to determine right and wrong, who is the persecuted, who is the prosecutor, is if it's in accordance with Allah. That's the only way. Everything else will lead you astray at one point or another. Even if you make a bunch of right decisions in a row, it's only a matter of time before you're going to make a really, really bad decision. So here he says, the study of perfecting one's character traits, which is Musaw, instills in one love and pity for the persecuted and severe condemnation of the persecutor. How terrible is it then, the danger of misidentifying the persecutor as the persecuted and vice versa. He says, you already spent all this time learning Musar, developing yourself, trying to become a better person. All of a sudden, you feel like you care about the world. You know, you used to wear t-shirts like, you know, life is this and all types of t-shirts that show your personality of how you care less about the whole world. Now, all of a sudden, you become, you know, Mr. Uh, Hasid. You want to help everybody. You love everybody. Because you develop yourself. You learn Hasidut. You learn Musa. You learn all these different things to perfect yourself. But here the Chazuni says, after you've spent all this time working on yourself, how terrible is it going to be? How terrible, how painful is it going to be when all of that Musa that you've learned led you astray because you've misidentified instead of helping the persecuted that poor guy that his wife cheated on him all the other examples all of the other victims the taxi driver instead of helping him you beat him up how terrible is it going to be when you find out that that's what actually happened and not only that that's what happened but it happened due to your musa not even it just happened no you learned and therefore you made a mistake because you were sensitive that's what you made a mistake so how can we fix this he says the only way to know the truth is to study the books of the Allahic authorities those books of rulings that we have received from the great rabbis of of the past in so many words Musa without Allah equals evil. Musa without Allah equals evil. Chasidut without Allah equals evil. Bad, terrible, horrible, any other adjective you want to come up with. No good. Why? Because you're going to develop certain tools, they're going to make you certain sensitivity to the world around you but you're going to use that sensitivity that passion that love for the enemy for the wrong thing so you see a guy he's very generous he wants to help yeah listen i just got a deal we just signed it i'm making a million dollars i want to make a big donation i'm going to give homish i'm going to give two hundred thousand dollars in staka great wow Chazaku baruch so what you do? What you what? What you do with it? What you do with it? Which which bet knesset did you uh did you uh no 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 bet knesset? All right, great. So even better. Which yeshiva? Which yeshiva did you donate the two hundred thousand dollars to? Which one? Which one? Did, in bet uh, poat yourself? Do you have this? Which one? No 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 yeshiva. Well, two hundred thousand dollars is a lot of money. So maybe a few yeshivas, kolels maybe. No no, not a kolel either. He says. Okay, so it's not a bet knesset. It's not a kolel. Not a issue. Ah, Kirov organization. You gave it to Bezat Hashem, a Kirov organization, or divine information. You gave it to Rabbi Zachi, Rabbi Yaron, uh, Rabbi Nava. Uh, who would you give it to? No, 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 not there, not there. Idabrut? No. Chabad? No, 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 no. So what'd you do with the money, man? I gave it to the new Noah Hyde Zoo. Their building. They said they needed to raise four hundred thousand dollars for gate for the new elephant bertha they're getting so i figured i'll take a half a stake i put two hundred thousand dollars in there and they're gonna put my name on there along with somebody else from my office that uh he got the other two hundred thousand gate 
Excuse me? You spent, you gave your Chomesh to build a gate for an elephant in a zoo? It's a Noahide zoo, man. Come on, oh. He developed kindness. He developed generosity. He even learned that you should give Tzedaka, not only Tzedaka, give Chomesh 20%. But he never learned Ilchot Talmud Torah. He never learned the Rambam. He never learned the Shulchan Aruch. He never learned anything that is going to show him how to use that newfound love that he has for 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 Hashem, for the Torah, how to utilize it. And therefore, he donated to the wrong place. And this happens countless times. Countless times. You see, Rabotai Karim, a person that learns Musal without learning Allah is bound to do bad things, horrible things, much worse than the example I just gave. You have people that feel like they want to help society by becoming judges becoming judges so true story a judge comes in sees there's a case in front of her what's going on with this case oh this arab was a uh blew up and now the israeli government wants to destroy his mother's house because that's the rule you have a son that's a terrorist in order to you know to 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 stop encouraging everybody else to do the same thing they said we'll destroy the house no israeli judge says no 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 that's too vicious that's too vicious we're not going to allow the uh them to destroy the mother's house why but that's the rule the rule is if this house produces terrorists that kills jewish people you should destroy the house no, no, that's too vicious. It's not her fault. It's not kind enough. It's not, you know, love for people. And then you see videos of the mother, the mother of this terrorist. After he blew himself up, she's celebrating in the middle of the street, throwing candy and celebrating as if it's like a Le'avdi, it's a bar mitzvah, a siyum shas. Why? My son is a shaheed. My son is a shaheed, she says. She's a, he killed himself. He's a martyr. He killed Jews. She's celebrating. She's throwing candy in the streets. This terrorist. But the Israeli judge says, no, no, no. It's not her fault. It's not her fault. He wants to be merciful. She wants to be merciful to this uh, terrorist mother. And this happens. This happens. Israeli government is doing it every single day now. The, the IDF soldiers are not allowed to shoot the terrorists. They're not allowed to shoot them. And if they shoot them, they have to shoot them in the legs. And only if that's the last condition. So while the terrorists are throwing rocks straight at their faces and sometimes doing other things, the Israeli soldiers are not allowed to respond. Countless videos are on the internet showing complete embarrassment to the Israeli soldiers, literally running away from a bunch of losers throwing rocks at them why because they're not allowed to defend themselves literally a guy with a rock a guy with a rock a little 15 year old kid with a rock is more powerful than an israeli soldier not because of the soldier because of the stupid government that feels like we need to be merciful to the terrorists we need to be merciful to the terrorists You see, Rabotai, without Musar and Alakha being combined, you'll end up turning into an evil person because you'll continuously make big mistakes by choosing the wrong side, such as the poor Palestinian or the poor animal or the uh this or that because you have no concept of how to make the decisions based on actual laws that are divine laws that are non-emotional you're going to do it based on emotions the prophet O'Shea in uh, chapter 13 verse 2 
says something scary. Says something scary. Says Adam Agalim Yeshevun. Says those who slaughter men shall kiss the calves. Arav Wasim and Allah Shalom. One time saw that there was a German woman picking up a dog, picking up her dog and giving it like kisses. And he started mourning, if you will, saying, Oh, no, oh, no, oh, no. So, you know, tell me, Dean, were there, like, Rabbi, why, why is it so bad? I mean, she's probably not married, she's lonely, and that dog is a companion. Doesn't the Torah say a dog is kelev, kulolev, it's all heart? She's just kissing a dog, no? He says, why don't you understand? Why don't you understand? Don't you understand the message from our prophet Oshea? Where he says, those who slaughter men shall kiss the calves. Because she's now using, she's using the love that she has. She's using the love that she has and expressing it to this animal. That means that the evil that she had has to go somewhere else. Where is it going to go? You'll see her and the rest of our people murdering people in cold blood, innocent people in cold blood. Mamash, like prophecy of what's going to happen a few years later in the Holocaust. This Rabotai was how the Chachamim saw the world. When you combine the intellect that you have to the Torah, to the extent where your intellect becomes one with the Torah, you start seeing the world in verses. You start seeing the world almost like in the eyes of Hashem. Oh, this is what this really means. This is what that really means. This is this and this is that. When you see the world based on emotions, unfortunately, you're constantly going to see the world in the wrong way. And some of the most important decisions that you'll have to make in your life will be the worst decisions of your life. Whether it's who to marry, who to divorce, when to do this, when to do that, who to choose as a partner, and so on and so forth. The Gemara in Maseret Baba Metzia, page 61b, has a very interesting debate in there where it talks about one of the Ten Commandments Lotignov don't steal don't steal it says this is an Allah we're not allowed to steal but what's the, what, what's the lesson here you have to know that you're not allowed to steal even if it is a joke even if you're just joking around like you know like sometimes people they like to mess with each other so your friend goes to the bathroom and when he comes back his wallet is missing now you're planning on giving it back to him you're planning on giving it back to him but you just want to stress him out for like a few minutes just see what he's out ah, i got you yeah here it is i got you hey, you think it's funny you just violated the law which may sin. but i was just joking okay shut mind they're not joking not allowed to do it not allowed to do it now what about if you want to be an extra really nice guy, not funny guy? You don't want to be a funny guy because you know the comedians sometimes they end up in gay no. Especially the stand-up comedians, they like to make fun of the crowd. It's not a good place. But needless to say, you want to be a nice guy. You see, you made a few dollars in your in your life, and you have a good business, you have a good job, but your buddy that grew up with you, I mean, the guy can't make it, th- he just can't. He's just not good at it, but he's really good at Torah. So you want to encourage him. But you know, he He's so righteous and he's so good that he doesn't want to ask for any handouts. He doesn't want to ask for any stock. He wants to work for his money. But no matter what he does, he can't make a living. So what do you do? You figure, you know what? I'm going to do this guy a favor. I'm going to steal something from him. Make sure there's two witnesses. Two witnesses. And they're going to see me stealing. Then I'm going to pretend like I'm running away. I'm not really planning on stealing it, but I'm going to pretend like I'm running away so they can catch me and I'm going to deny it. I didn't steal. I didn't steal. And they're going to prove it to me that I stole, meaning they caught me. So that way we have to go to a bed dean. The bed deans that say, you stole, you got caught. There was two witnesses. All of the requirements were met. 
you not only have to give him the money back, but you have to give him double. And no one's going to be happier than me. Huh? Why? Because really all I want to do is I want to give him the money, but he won't take it from me. So what I'm going to do, he just got an inheritance. He got an inheritance, I don't know, $50,000 from his uh, somebody. And out $50,000, that may carry him for, for, I don't know, six months, a year. He's got a big family. I want to help him out. I got the money. He doesn't want to take it from me. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to take the $50,000 from him because he trusts me. So he left it on the table. I'm going to take him, run from the house. They're going to catch me. And that way, I can give him 50000 extra. Now he has $100,000. Now he can study in peace. Is that a mitzvah, Rabbi? Sounds good. Sounds even righteous. Sounds so righteous like, wow, what an invention. Gemara says, wrong. You have just violated the Torah. How would you violate it? Lo tignov. You just violated one of the Ten Commandments. What do you mean? But I really only wanted to help him and just give him the money. I didn't really plan on stealing it. You stole. Why? You used your Musar that you learned, your Hasidu that you learned to be a nice guy because you have more than he does and you want to be a nice guy. But you did not look at what the Lacha says. Allah says, as kind as you are, as nice as you are, you're not allowed to express that niceness and that kindness that way. You want to give it to him, write him a check. Give it to him anonymously. Put it in his mailbox. Find another way. You're not allowed to steal. Not allowed to steal. Now you're going to arrive in Shemaim thinking you're going to get rewarded, and in reality you're going to say, oh, here's Steve the thief. Poor guy stole from him fifty thousand dollars. The poor Avrech barely makes a living. He stole money from him. You know, you're gonna look behind it. What? What? Who's is somebody else here? Steve? Somebody else here? Steve? And no one's behind you. No one's behind you. You're the only one in there. He's, wait, you're talking about me? I didn't steal fifty thousand dollars. No, no, I, I, I gave. I gave fifty thousand dollars. No, no, you're the thief. You are the thief. And you're gonna want to bury yourself again. Why? Because you thought you did good. But in reality, you did bad. That's what was Paskin to Allah in the Shulchan Aruch Hoshin Mishpat, section 348, Saif 1. Not allowed to steal, even if it's for laughing matters, as a joke, or even to pay back your friend double. Not allowed to steal. Now, some people say, okay, listen, all right, I'm not going to steal from Jews, I'm going to steal from non Jews. Why? They're going in. We don't need them. Yeah, they're, they, they're like our slaves, right? This is the stupid mentality some Jewish people have. They think that the goyim are just like nobodies and we could just take advantage of them. So some people that I've actually spoken to literally believe this. What do they do? They, they, do, they have these businesses called cash advance because that's unfortunately the, the, the epidemic in the business world, if you will. There are other epidemics, but that's the biggest one in my opinion at this point. They figure, listen, I'm in a cash advance business. I loan people money with extremely high interest. A good deal is like 40, 50% interest. A normal deal is more like 80, 90, 100% and his life. Like, you know, pretty much until I suck his blood out, we haven't finished the deal yet. And that's what they do. They lend people money. You tell them, listen, Habibi, you're not allowed to lend money to Jews with interest. Oh, okay, so I'll just lend it to the goyim. Yeah, but there's also another lacha. You're not allowed to steal. You're not allowed to take advantage. You're not allowed to do all types of things that are unethical and so on and so forth. We have like five, six, seven shurim about this particular topic. Cash advanced business or anything like it is forbidden according to the Torah. So they respond to you like, no, no, no. Don't worry, Rabbi. All my clients are non-Jews. And I say, I am worried and even more worried now because all of your clients are non-Jews. Why? Because now it's even worse. You think that you're allowed to steal from non-Jews. What you don't realize is that now your kindness to the Jewish people just added an additional sin to your account called Chilul Hashem. Called Chilul Hashem. A sin that's so bad 
So bad the Gemara Masechet Yoma says, some sins you can just simply say I'm sorry. Some sins you have to wait for Yom Kippur to say I'm sorry. Some sins you have to say I'm sorry, Yom Kippur, and also get some suffering in this world. He says, but there is a sin. There is a sin that Yom Kippur is going to help, not going to help you. Saying I'm sorry is not going to help you. And suffering is not going to help you. What's going to help you? Dying. That's the only way it's going to help you. That's when you start repenting for that sin. What sin? Chilul Hashem. Chilul Hashem, tshuva starts with dying. Chachamim almost had a heart attack on the page. So if somebody desecrated Hashem's name, he has to die to start doing tshuva? Yes. Or he could do kiddush Hashem, which is the exact opposite sanctification of Hashem's name. But don't think that you could just do Chilul Hashem as much as you want and then do Kiddush Hashem to rectify it. Someone says, I'm going to sin, then do Tshuva, I'm going to sin, then do Tshuva, I'm going to sin, then do Tshuva. Hashem says, no Tshuva. So don't play games with HaKadosh Baruch Hu. The point is, Rabotai, a person thinks he's lending money to non-Jews with high interest, taking, taking advantage of them, doing things that are unethical, or he sells them one and he gives them something else, he sells them something new, but in reality it's refurbished. He does all these different things to cheat non-Jews and he thinks he's doing a kindness because he donates money or he does good things. Wrong. Wrong, wrong, wrong. You just added another sin to your belt and it becomes a Chilul Hashem. So much so that Rashi, Rashi, Shalom, Rashi says this honest business by Jews gives koach le'amalek. This honest business by Jews against non-Jews gives strength to Amalek. Go look at the verses. That's the commentary he says. You thought you were doing good things because you figured I'm gonna do business, take advantage of these evil goyim, these evil non-Jews, in order to give money to my brothers, the Jewish people. Use your Musar, you know, to, to completely destroy the Torah, if you will. Why? Because Musar, without a lacha, is evil. And what ended up happening, you did business, dishonest business, thinking that as long as it's dishonest with the non-Jews, therefore everything's okay. Not only is it not okay, you made matters worse. You just gave birth to the new Hitler. You just gave birth to the new Haman. You just gave birth to coronavirus. You just gave birth to all of the bad in the world with your evil that meant to be good. But guess what? If millions of people die because of you, no one's going to say, yeah, but he meant well. No one's going to say that. No one's going to say that. And that's unfortunately Rabotai, what's happening in the world where you have people, they mean well. But that meaning well means nothing if it's not in accordance with Allah. And that's why the very same Shulchan Aruch, section 348, we went from safe one, the rules in regards to Goim, in regards to the Gentiles, is safe two. The very next Allah. Very next one. Now let's do such a thing. Now, the Gaon Mivilna, the Gaon Mivilna, in the Sefer Evan Shlema, in the fourth section, in the 23, 23rd Daf, in the uh, bedside, side, Ot 13, section 13, says in regards to Minim, regards to people that are not only heretics, but entice other people to sin, and also people that are sinners against Hashem. He writes something extraordinary. He writes the following. He says, in regards to Minim and sinners against Hashem, most of them are good-natured people. Again, Rova minim, Rova minim, Vachotim ben Adam la makom, em tovim bateva. Most of the minim and the ones that sin against Hashem 
are good-natured people. It's not finished, though. And this is one of the strategies of the Satan himself. You see, Rabotai, the people that work for the Satan, they don't all walk around with machetes and Uzis killing whoever's in front of them. In fact, the Gaumi Vinu says the opposite. Most of them walk around with a smile. Danke, Shane. How are you? Thank you. Harasho. All types of, you know, and every. Salam alaikum. Everything, every language. Hola. People that hate Hashem to the extent of getting other people away from Him, bringing them to Christianity, bringing them to atheism, bringing them to, to liberalism, all of those people, along with the people that are simply going against Hashem. How? Doesn't want to keep Shabbat. You tell them, listen, but you know you have to keep Shabbat. No, I don't feel like it. It's not for me. He said, most of those people, they're going to see around you, they're not evil people in the open where you see them, there's blood all over their faces. They just killed 15 people. No, most of them are good natured people. Walk around with a smile, say hello to you. Sometimes you may even think they're nicer than the Froom people that you live next door to. And the Gaon Mivilna says, this, this exact thing is one of the tools of the Satan to give them the ability to be good natured. They have generosity, but they're generous to the wrong places. They have uh, intellect, but they use their intellect in the wrong places. They have all types of things that Hashem gifts them with, but they just utilize them in the wrong places. Now, the problem is, Rabotai, is that many times you'll see that people that either are new to the tshuva world or sometimes just uh, they're, they're from for a long time but they're a little bit naive when it comes to people perhaps maybe because they're young or, or they don't have that much experience you see that many times that they look at the secular people around them in their job their office uh, customers and so on it's like oh look this guy's really nice he's really nice he's not religious so, you see, you don't have to be religious to, to be a nice person. You don't have to be religious to be a nice person. This guy's really nice. Every time I see him, he says hello to me. He, he, he gives me a gift once a year. This, that. He's a really nice person. Musa without a lacha is evil. Meaning, that person is nice to you. He's nice to you because he's good-natured. He's nice to you because he has good things about him. No, no questions asked. He has good things about him. Perhaps he's generous. Perhaps he's a, uh, uh, a lot of things. He's got good things. But push comes to shove. Hashem analyzes overall totality of his actions. And see, evil came out more than good. Why? The way he expressed these things that he has, these things that she has, hurt more than it helped people. Simple. She feels like, she has live and let live live and let live she says listen i help whoever i can i uh, if i can't help i'll try to get somebody else to help she has a mentality to help whoever she can she's very kind she's very social and so on she thinks that's you say oh see my next door neighbor she's really nice she's always kind she's always smiling at us and so on she thinks she's fantastic right okay so because she's so free willy so she decides to walk around half naked in the streets and she winks at everybody and she thinks it's cute to say hello to Mr. Such and Such even though he's married and he's got a few kids and she doesn't realize that Mr. Such and Such may actually take what she says seriously and start talking and thinking and this and that and she doesn't realize she's actually hurting his marriage and she doesn't realize she's hurting a bunch of people's marriages and if that's not bad enough she's even hurting her own marriage why because her husband doesn't like that she's winking at every single guy that she sees because she's cute and because she's this and because she's that so her friendliness her her kindness her, it's not so good why it's producing more bad than good you saw the good of it but you are one percent of the totality and that's the reality of Musa without Allah evil 
מוסר ולהלך. Any type, any type of good that you have, if you do not use that good in accordance with the rules of the Torah that Hashem put into the world, for sure it will produce more bad than good. Because you will not know how to express that good in a good way on a consistent basis. Surely there are going to be times that will be net, net good. But there are going to be times that it's going to be more bad than good, which cancels out a lot of the bad. Now, the same Gaomi Vilna, same Gaomi Vilna in uh, the fifth section, the fifth section of the Evan Shlema in uh, page 27b, says that there are some people that toil to do mitzvot. Toil to do mitzvot. Many times this is Bale Tshuva. They're hot. They want to do as many mitzvot as possible. Oh, let me help you out, ma'am. Let me help you out, sir. Let me do this. Let me do that. They want to do chesed. They want to be here. They want to be there. They want to be involved. Or sometimes you'll see this in a... Uh, in the from from world as well i want to do this i want to do that the kindness the one who mitzvot 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 who i can help where i can raise money where i can do this where i can do that they want to do it but the gaumi vilna says the following now again the gaumi vilna is not somebody that we could just simply like ignore we can't just ignore the gaumi vilna you know why because the chazonish the chazonish same chazonish that we're talking to the same chazonish we're reading is sefer chazonish wrote when it comes to our sages, it comes to Moshe Rabbeinu, comes to uh, Aaron Cohen, David Melech, all of their the, the malachim, comes to our sages, Rabbi Akiva, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, Rambam, their malachim, they're angels, they're angels. But then he says the following. But in the same line, we have Moshe Rabbeinu, we have Ezra Sofer. We have Rambam, we have Gaumi Vilna. Meaning, he put him in the path. Path. Even though there's hundreds of years of difference between the Rambam and the Gaumi Vilna. He says, we look at the Gaumi Vilna like he's one of the Rishonim. That's why when he d- debates the Rishonim, he debates Rambam or anybody else. Don't, don't look at it like as if, well, who is he to debate him? He's only from a few hundred years ago. Uh, Rambam is from... No, 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 no. Gaumi Vilna, the Gra, Yad Roch HaKodesh. He's one of the Rishonim. Don't look at him like anybody else. He's unique. Unique. The same Gaumi Vilna writes the following. There are some people that want to do many mitzvot. They toil for mitzvot. They toil for mitzvot. But those mitzvot, he says, are not based on Torah, meaning they're not learning any Torah. Yes, the guy, listen, you want to come to the shiur? No, 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 I'm not going to come to the shiur. No, come on, come to the shiur. No, no, I got, I got, I got, a, I got a chesed opportunity. I'm taking uh, his grandmother to the, uh, to the airport. Yeah, but you have a, you could, she could take a cab. You can go to the shiur to learn. No, 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 listen, I can't, I can't. Okay, fine, next week. Next week, tell me, you want to come to the shiur to learn? You know, the guy's interesting, he's popular, it's good, it's musar, it's good. No, 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 I got something else. What, what do you have to do today? What, another grandmother needs to go to the airport again? No, 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 I got to pick up groceries for Steve because Steve is busy with work and he's not going to be able to do it and I don't want him to have shlom bite problems so I'm going to go pick up the groceries for him and drop it off at his house. Wait, so you can't go to the shiur to learn because... You're picking up groceries, why don't you just pay somebody to do it? No, come on, you got to do it yourself, got to get your hands dirty, that's the real chesed. No, Habibi, learning Torah is chesed for yourself. No, 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 you're extreme, no, I'm doing the mitzvot, you can go learn, don't worry. Or best yet, you want to come to the shul? Listen, I'll come for five minutes. Five minutes, a two-hour shul, you come for five minutes, what are you going to do in five minutes? Smoking a cigarette takes longer than five minutes. No, come five minutes. And he sits there five minutes, ten minutes. He's playing with his phone, not even listening to the shiul. That's the type of people that some people, 
when it comes to doing chesed giving somebody a ride buying groceries raising money for somebody he loves it she loves it as an opportunity to get an event together for the community gathers it all everybody together make sure she calls everybody to come to the event come this is support for judaism this that good right gaul mavina says the following there are some people there are some people they toil for mitzvot toil for them but they don't learn to love those mitzvot are not based on their torah learning they're based on just doing good things on them it is written the gaomi vilna says prophet isaiah chapter 1 verse 11 Lama li rav zvechim yomar Hashem. why do i need your numerous sacrifices says hashem in so many words who needs your kindness if that kindness is not going to come from your Torah learning if that kindness that you are expressing is only because it soothes you it's only because it fits your mental capacity it's only because it agrees with your heart and your feelings but now because of my Torah who needs it Hashem says who needs it that's what Akadosh Baruch Hu says. You have a problem? Go to Gaomi Vina. He'll give you a private shiur. Rabotai Yekarim. We have one of the Dole Olam telling us that without learning Torah, we are in deep trouble. We are in very, very deep trouble because we don't even know how to express how to express the good character traits that we're learning. Now, the Gaomi Vilna had a lot to say, Baruch Hashem. When one of his Talmidim learned the Rashid Chokhmah, Masechet Genom, with him, the student got descriptions of the details which the Gaomi Vin also uh, talks about in his Evan Shlema. Uh, the student got so scared that he passed out. So once he woke up, he told the Rebbe, you know, you scared me so much. <clears throat> it was dangerous. So the Gaomi Vin says to him, what do you think? Because you passed out, I'm going to change the truth for you. Number one, everything that I said to you is true. Number two, it's much more than what I said. Meaning, the truth is even more than what I said. So, the God was never steering away from the truth. It doesn't mean that he didn't care about Am Yisrael. He, he, he sacrificed his whole life for Am Yisrael. His whole life for the Torah itself. But the point is, Rabotai, is that when the Chachamim say something, they're not just saying it in passing. They're not just saying it just because it sounds good or perhaps it's a uh, it's going to get them a, a new clip on youtube they didn't have youtube in those days when they said something about Thai, they said it a uh, in such a way that they made sure that you understood that this is significant now one of the things that i see in uh from a lot of young people is that do tshuva or uh, you know even if they come from from uh, backgrounds you know once they watch our shulim they start learning some musar they never learned before and they start doing tshuva and they start uh, getting stronger when it comes to tikkun abrid when it comes to learning a little bit and it comes to doing different things which is good but for whatever reason or another the the people feel like if they are growing in Musal, if they are growing in their Torah and the world around them doesn't grow with them, then that makes everybody else inferior to them. That type of mentality is Musa without Alacha. Why? Because it can turn the good that you're doing into bad. Now, Baruch Hashem, this is not so common to the point where I have to deal with this every day but I've heard this a few times already and I've had to rebuke a few students of mine when I heard them either or them or somebody else tell me what they were doing 
and I realized that they were going in the wrong direction. And again, each circumstance is different. They're not all the same, so that's why you have to hear the st- stories from both sides in many cases. But one of the things that's very common uh, that I've seen today is that people think that just because they're growing and their parents perhaps are not getting the same uh, ability to grow spiritually, the same ability uh, to, uh, to invest as much time in Torah, and that makes their parents inferior. And they forget that honoring your father and your mother is not a suggestion by Hashem. There's a couple of verses in the Torah that says that you have an obligation. This is part of the Ten Commandments to honoring your parents. In Exodus 20, chapter 12, Kadosh Baruch Hu says, honor your father and your mother. And then again, Kadosh Baruch Hu says to Shlomo Melech in Proverbs 3, 9, honor God with your wealth. So by using the same terminology of honoring, the Torah is simply telling us that you owe your father and your mother the same honor that you have to give the Almighty. Now, every person has to respect their parents, as it says in Leviticus 19.3. And it also says that Hashem, your Lord, you shall respect. And Him you shall serve in Deuteronomy 10.20. So here the word respect is being used. And the Torah is telling us again, why is it using respect Hashem to respect your parents? Because you owe your parents respect just like you owe Hashem respect. And whoever curses their father and their mother must be put to death, Exodus 21.1 says. Right? It says the same thing about Hashem. Anyone that curses Hashem shall bear his sin in Leviticus 24.15. So the Torah compares cursing parents with cursing the Almighty. They say, yeah, but it doesn't say... It says cursing the parents bears, you know, it's a uh, uh, death penalty. But uh, when cursing Hashem, it says you'll bear his sin. So it doesn't actually say the same thing. Well, it doesn't say the same exact thing, but we know it's the same thing. Why? Because we have the famous story of the blasphemer who cursed Hashem and Hashem killed him simply. So you see the action. When a person honors his father and his mother, a Kadosh Baruch Hu says, I consider it as though I lived among them and they honored me. Which means that when you're learning Torah, when you're learning Musa, when you're learning all these good things, but you're not implementing, you're not implementing this Musa the right way. You're learning Torah, but that Torah is making you more egotistical. That Torah is making you more uh, of a uh, chauvinist. That Torah is making you more of a, uh, I don't know, a show-off, conceited, and all of these other things. Lo ba shamaimi, your Torah is not from Shamaim. It was better off you didn't learn. Why? Because it's supposed to be Torah with Allah. You're supposed to be a representative of Hashem. By you learning Torah, you're supposed to, in essence, show, Hashem, show the world how the Torah is softening you, making you a better person. But if you learn in Torah is making you a, a worse person, you're nasty to everybody, you yell at people, you tell them they're nothing because you think you know more than them, that's not, that's not Torah. That's not Torah, and unfortunately this happens sometimes with people's parents. Rabbi Eliezer, Rabbi Eliezer Agadol says, if, if my father says, bring me a drink of water, and my mother says, bring me a drink of water, which one should I give? Which one? Answer is, leave your mother's honor for a moment and fulfill the honor of your father. Why? Because both of you are obligated to respect your father. So he doesn't say, disrespect your mom. Just that if there is somehow you're getting tested from Shemaim by both of them are asking for a drink at the same time and there's no way for you to give them both at the same time, then go give it to your father and then give it to your mother. Why? Because that's Musa with Allah. Now you can say, yeah, but my mom is nicer to me. Maybe I should give it to her first. You know, my mom is the... No, there's Musa and there's Allah. And you have to combine the two. You have to combine the two. Now, one of the things that a person needs to know when it comes to honoring their parents why is it one of the Ten Commandments because it's not only something that Hashem uh, uh, says if you honor your parents it's like honoring me if you dishonor your parents you're dishonoring me but more than that honoring your parents is in essence one of the ways that we validate the Torah to the world at large and it says in Psalm 138 4 all the kings of the earth will acknowledge you, God, because they heard your statements. 
So it doesn't say statement, but rather it's a statement, it's plural. So when the Holy One blessed is he, he says, I am God, your Lord, and do not have any other gods before me. In Exodus 22, all the nations of the world said he's looking for his own honor. So all of the heretics, and I've had conversations with some of them, they say, what kind of God punishes? What is he, sadistic? Why does he give you a world that you can sin? If he wanted you to do good things, let him just give you the ability to do good things. Make you a robot in so many words. Why is he going to punish you for following a desire that he gave you? So the heretics are going to tell you, oh, this, this God of yours, he wants honor to himself. He, uh, you know, he's, uh, he's uh, I don't want to believe in such a God that wants honor to himself. So there's a verse in the Torah that deals with such people where when it says that uh, Kadosh Baruch Hu says to honor Hashem, all of the naysayers said, look, your God is looking for honor. Now, it also says, you tell them, in the same place, in the same place in Exodus 20, 12, it says that you have to honor your father and your mother, showing that Hashem, as great and as mighty as He is, is also telling you to honor other people that are His own creation, showing that HaKadosh Baruch Hu, HaKadosh Baruch Hu is, in essence, trying to make you a good person, not just showing Him honor. So by showing honor to your parents, the Chachamim say, is in essence a validation of the entire Torah. Because it's showing the nations that it's not just Hashem uh, looking for honor of himself, but rather it's Hashem in essence perfecting, allowing us to perfect ourselves. This comes from the Gemara Masechet Kiddushin, page 31. Now, There is a very famous story in the same Gemara Masechi Kiddush in page 31 about a Goy, about a Goy that was, his name was Dama ben Netina. Dama ben Netina was a person that the Chachamim say, if you want to know about the, what we're supposed to get to as far as honoring parents, at the very least we need to get to that level. Why? One time the Chachamim were... Uh, looking for a special jewel because the Kohen Gadol lost one of the jewels in the Choshen. So those jewels were very unique and they found out that this guy, Dama Benetina, has this special jewel. So they came to him and they said to him, listen, we're looking for this jewel. So he said, okay, I want, you know, uh, let's say X amount of money, $100,000. They said, deal. He didn't know what they needed for. He didn't know that he could pretty much name any price. So he said, $100,000. He said, okay, deal, deal. Okay, so he goes to get this jewel, but he sees that his father is sleeping on top of the key. And he doesn't want to wake him up, so he comes back, and his dad Benetina says, I'm sorry, I can't sell you the jewel. He says, why not? Because I can't sell you the jewel. I can't, my father's sleep. I can't do it. Listen, you can wake him up. No, I can't wake him up. We'll give you $200,000. We need it for the coin gadol. It's not a, that's a big deal. Can't two hundred thousand dollars? We double the price. No, three hundred thousand dollars. No, four hundred thousand dollars. No, six hundred thousand. Six hundred thousand, and some say even eight hundred thousand. And he still said no. Chachamim realized at that point. That's it. This guy, Majnun, he's crazy. Doesn't doesn't want to. Why? His father's sleeping. His father's sleeping on the key. He's not going to wake him up. They left. The Chachamim were amazed at how much honor he showed his father that he didn't want to wake him up. He lost 600,000 to 800,000 in profit because of this. Kadosh Baruch Hu blessed him. A year later, a year later, one of his cows gave birth to a red heifer, to a red cow, perfectly red cow, which they need in the Bet HaMikdash for the sake of purifying the people. There's only nine in history have been born, red cows, and he had one of them. Chachamim came to him, and this time, this time, this uh, Dan Benetina knew exactly what he has in his hands. And he said to him, listen, we heard you have a red cow, this is a kosher cow, we want it. We want to buy it from you. He tells them, I know that I can charge you any price that I want, and you'll pay for it. But all I want is just to make up for the lost money that I missed out on last year. That's all I want. Deal. 
So you see that this Dama Benetina had great Musa, had good traits, had good traits. The Chachamim say, if a guy that's not obligated to honor his parents to the same extent as a Jew, not only honors his parents, but gets rewarded by a Kadosh Baruch Hu for doing so. Look, he honored his parents, he honored his father when he doesn't have to. And clearly a Kadosh Baruch Hu rewarded him by giving him a priceless possession like the red heifer. So he's not, he's not obligated and he did it. And a Kadosh Baruch Hu rewarded him. And we already know from Rabbi Hanina says that surely Hashem rewards a person that fulfills the mitzvah when he's obligated to do it much more than when he's not obligated to do it. Why? You would think the opposite. You would think that the guy that's not obligated to do a mitzvah, he gets rewarded more than a guy that, that's not, that is obligated. Wrong. Why is it wrong? Because the guy that's obligated, the guy that's obligated to do a mitzvah also has the evil inclination telling him not to do it. The Satan comes to him and says, don't go to the Torah. Yeah, but I need to go to the Torah. Don't go to the Torah. But I need to go to the Torah. The guy that's not obligated, there's no Yetzirah. Yetzirah says he's not obligated. Who cares what he does? Who cares what he does? Yeah, but he's going to get a reward. Okay, so let him get a reward. He's not obligated. Yetzirah doesn't interfere. Doesn't interfere. This is also a side note. Also, why it's much easier, much, much easier for Noahides to learn a Shi'ur Torah than for Jews. A Noahide can listen to an eight-hour Shi'ur straight without sleeping or even coffee. A Jew... Eight minutes sometimes is too hard. Why? Yetzirah is very different. It doesn't mean that they don't have a Yetzirah at all, but it's very, very different. Worlds apart. Why? The Jew is obligated, obligated to learn Torah to a much, much higher extent. Much higher extent than a Noahide. The point being is, is that Kadosh Baruch is telling us, if you fulfilled my mitzvah, when you're obligated, the reward is much higher. That doesn't mean that you won't get a reward if you fulfill the mitzvah when you're not obligated. You'll get it. It's just not going to be as high. So here the Chachamim are telling us, look at this. This Dama ben Netina, he didn't even have a mitzvah to do it. He doesn't have to honor his parents to such an extent. And still Hashem rewarded him so handsomely. How much more so would Hashem reward us if we honor our parents as much as he did, especially when we're obligated? Now you see, Rabotai, without having, without having Musal combined with Alacha, we're not even going to know we have to honor our parents. Why? Because you can learn to be nice, but then you're going to say, okay, so I should be nice to my parents no matter what. That's not true either. Why? Because sometimes you have the unfortunate circumstance where your parents are anti-Torah, and they tell you to do anti-Torah things like, drive me to the mall on Shabbat, or cook me a pig, or something like that. You can't do it. Yeah, but didn't you just say I have to honor my parents? Yes, you have to honor your parents, but in accordance to Allah. If what your parents are telling you to do is in accordance with Allah, you have to honor them the highest you possibly can. But if what your parents are telling you to do is against Allah, then you're not allowed to honor them. Not allowed to honor them. What about if they sin on their own? Let's say, for example, if your father, perhaps he's dishonest somewhere, or he did something that's unbeknownst of a Jew. Does that mean that you're allowed to dishonor him? Absolutely not. So much so that my own rabbi told me. He said, even if somebody's mother is a prostitute, he still has to show her honor. To that extent. Even if his mother is a prostitute, he still has to show her honor. Why? She's not doing it in front of you. She's not doing it in front of you. She's not telling you to be a prostitute. She's not telling you to do something against Hashem. She's making a mistake on her own. That doesn't mean that you're allowed to dishonor her. She see, Rabbi Karim is that it's very easy for us to judge everybody else and not judge ourselves. That's what happens when you only have Musa without Allah. But when you have both, when you have both, you could literally become an Ish Kadosh. You could become a holy person, holy woman, holy man, and so on and so forth. This is one of the greatest things about Torah is that it never ends. It never ends. It always helps us in every single thing that we can. But we have to stay loyal to it. We have to stay loyal to it by dedicating our time, our resources, and everything we possibly can. But most importantly, most importantly, dedicating our decisions to it. Do not make a decision without making sure that it's in accordance with the Torah. 
Now, make sure that in accordance with the Torah means in accordance with the Torah, not in accordance with what you think is the Torah. Because that is the last part that is that happens many times. We see there are certain people that they start off good, they do tshuva, they convert, whatever the case may be, and little by little they grow. Little by little they grow, and they figure that they outgrow their original rabbi that helped them do tshuva, that helped them convert, or both. And they say, listen, I'm not going to listen to the rabbi anymore. I'm too busy. I got to learn my Gemara. I got to learn my Musa. I got to learn my Alacha. I got to learn everything else. And I'm going to be my own rabbi. Uh, Rashi is going to be my rabbi. Rambam is going to be my rabbi. And the Rabbi Yosef Kawa is going to be my rabbi. And I'll pick a few poskim. Why? Because I'm already, I'm beyond the shulim. I'm already 10, 20 years already into the, uh, into the Torah world. The rabbi is still talking about things from 20 years ago for me. I've passed the rabbi. The prophet Isaiah, chapter 5, verse 20, says, Woe to the people. Woe to the people who speak of evil as good and good as evil. There are unfortunately people that get ahead of themselves. They think that just because they did a certain amount, they paid their dues, if you will, They've graduated to the point where they don't need instructions. They could just be their own rabbi, or they could just tell their rabbi what to do, or they could talk down to the rabbi, and so on and so forth. There's no bigger mistake than that. There's no bigger mistake than that because simply you can take your entire 10, 20, 30 years of learning Torah and that entire Gan Eden that you built and throw it in the garbage. Why? You just lost Olam Abba. Some people literally can lose Olam Abba just like this. I heard of Nisim again, Allah wa Shalom. When I first heard it, I started shaking. Why? The way he said it, and I knew it's 100% source-based. It's not like, oh, he's just trying to scare the crowd. 100% he says, listen, he was doing it already for decades. He built community. He says, you don't understand how easy it is to lose Olam Abba. He says, you can lose Olam Abba just like that. And unfortunately, Rabotai Karim, sometimes that's exactly what happens. A person can build themselves an Olam Abba for 10, 20, 30 years because he's doing good mitzvot. She's doing good mitzvot. Do good, 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 good. But at some point, they figure that they know enough, Musar and Alacha, that they don't necessarily need to check. They could just do. Mistake. Mistake. You always have to check. With who? With the rabbi. And not just the rabbi that you like, and not just the rabbi that's closest, not just the rabbi that agrees with you. You have to make sure that's 100% the halacha. Because if you're wrong, you could literally lose Olam Abba. On the smallest things, or what we think is the smallest things. Because we can, with those smallest things can literally be a mistranslation to the extent of you will say that the good is bad and the bad is good. And that's why the prophet Isaiah continues in the following verse, Oy chachamim be'enehem. Woe to those who are wise in their own eyes. He says, woe to the people who speak of evil as good and good as evil. And then he says, woe to those who are wise in their own eyes. Why do they get to the point that they see evil as good and good as evil? sweet as bitter bitter as sweet and so on and so forth why because they became wise in their own eyes they became wise in their own eyes they figured no no i'm already past the shooting this is uh i'm not a beginner anymore they think that just because they did a few mitzvot they passed that means you have not learned anywhere near enough musal as you think and even more so you haven't even graduated the point of musal to know that your musal has to always be connected with Allah has to be connected with Allah. So long as those two are not connected, you're not even a beginner's level yet. So this Rabotai Karim is the next section of what the Chazunish, Bezat Hashem, succeeded in teaching us. Next week, Bezat Hashem, will continue this particular series. We have much more to come later on this week. Again, I always remind you, please download the app to watch the lectures. If you're not watching it live, uh, Bezat Hashem, one day we'll have the, even the uh, the live lectures on the uh, app live, but that's coming in the future. 
But in the meantime, please download the app and share the app. Share the app with all of your friends, family, anyone that you care about, and even if you don't care about. As long as they're Jewish or they're a decent human being that wants to know about God, share the app with them. Let them uh, at least have a chance, a chance to learn the truth. It's Be'ezrat Hashem on the App Store iOS or the Android B-E-E, Z-R-A-T, H-A-S-H-E-M. Download the app. You could... uh, See, there's a lot of lectures over there, Baruch Hashem, thousands of lectures in Hebrew and English. There's also a section to uh, ask questions, a section to donate, and Baruch Hashem, much more coming. Uh, Baruch Hashem, we'll talk again later on this week. Thank you again for learning with me. Baruch Adonai Le'olam. Amen Amen. You know when you have a dream and you see a pretty woman? You've had that? Now you never actually see an ugly woman in dreams. It's always a pretty woman. And by the way, it's always the same woman for all of us. All of us have a dream of the same exact woman. And she's more dangerous than the Satan himself. Who is she? not even allowed to say her name. What are you going to call for? People are addicted to it. I live a normal life. Repent and you will find salvation. Simply go to our website, bezatashem.org, and may Hashem continue to bless you.